Thank you, James. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll get underway. I know some are likely to have to leave at 2 o'clock for lectures, so I will stop then. In fact, I, what I will aim to do is to finish talking about a quarter to so that anyone who has to leave early has a chance to ask questions before they leave. So that's my aim. Uh, but I'm known for talking too much, and so maybe not guarantee that. We'll, we'll see how we, we so, see how we go. Okay, so uh, this is a topic, big, complex topic. And the first thing is to explain that this talk is not the result of research. I do not research neoliberalism. What I do is try to understand how neoliberalism impinges on my work. So it's not research about neoliberalism, it is about understanding why what I try to do and what we try to do is messed up by neoliberalism. So it's the interaction between them. So I'm not an economist, theoretical economist. I'm, I'm, I have studied economics, but I wouldn't call that my parent discipline. Geography is my parent discipline. And as you know, geographers, all they're good for is colouring in. So um, uh, uh, we'll see. We'll see where we go. So one of the problems with understanding this is the confusion about the terminology, incredible confusion about the terminology. So I just looked up a few American think tanks, which are usually regarded as being conservative and on the right, because it's quite interesting, because they talk about liberty. So this is one, the Liberty Fund, um, which is um, preservation, restoration, and development of individual liberty through investigation, research, and educational activity. And they enable you to read free books. It's quite useful if you want to look at some books on uh, um, Enlightenment philosophy. That's just one of many. I, have, I couldn't cover them all, but this is the Cato in Institute, which is probably one of the most famous and infamous yeah. of the institutes. Yeah. If you look at what it says about itself here, and blow it up. Can you all see that? Yeah? So it's, it's, it's got a very clear statement of what they, they think. You see that liberty is the word that is coming out. Liberty is then linked to freedom. So we then have the Freedom Foundation. Our mission is to advance individual liberty, free enterprise, and limited accountable government. So you're beginning to get the flavor. And these are institutions which are pushing, if we use the term neoliberalism, they are pushing the neoliberal agenda. So you immediately see, now here we immediately see a problem because you'll also remember a very famous economist called Amartya Sen, whose one of his books is called Development as Freedom. So we're into a kind of an area in which there is disputes even about what appear to be basic words, such as freedom and liberty, um, in which there is this very confusing terminology. Um, so I want to do some of today to look at that. So left wing, right wing in, in the United States, more likely to be called conservative than right wing, but also in the United States, what a liberal is left wing and a liberal to people who are on that side of the slide, a liberal is, is a term of abuse in the United States. So you're, you're um, uh, close to being a communist if you're a liberal amongst the people who support those, those think tanks that I showed you at the start. Um, but we see that liberty is one of their words. Both sides use the word freedom. And we, we have very little understanding of what they mean freedom from what. Well, on the right, it would be freedom from government, an interfering government, and to do what? Um, for Sen, it would be freedom to fulfill your human potential. Key point about the issues going on here is that on this side, there is a general understanding that problems in the world, such as poverty, um, uh, inequality, racism, are systemic. They should be looking for explanations which are about how society is structured. Whereas on, the, on this side, the problems of society are because people are choosing to behave badly, and what needs to happen is people need to take responsibility for their individual behaviour, and it is, if you are poor, it's because you're lazy. 
So this is one of the powerful explanations that is used, um, especially in the United States, about that. Now, um, this means that you want people to take responsibility individually. You want small government. On this side, where you think the problem is system causation, it is about the government fulfilling a role of moderating the effects of markets, where markets are perceived as, as failing. So this kind of sets up the problem. that We immediately have terminology of difficulty in this. And this, I think, is part of the, the, a lot of the confusion around neoliberalism, because we use the word neoliberalism, and it's regarded as being bad by many people, and yet it is using the word liberal in it, which on this, people would say, we are good if we're liberal. So the word neoliberalism is using a word which is both criticised and supported in this way. So it, it becomes very, very confusing. We also have the problem that, uh, and, and sorry, um, on this side, it's against, that's gone in the wrong place, against Keynesian economics over that side. Now, there's also confusion, confusion about whether neoliberalism is the same as globalisation. I will argue, and I won't have much time to do it, that is not the case. Globalisation has a very long history. It goes back, to my mind, uh, there are different globalisations, but that dominated by um, Europe, it goes back 500 years. Neoliberalism, as you will see, I'll identify it as being around 40, 50 years in terms of its dominance. And then others wonder if neoliberalism is the same as capitalism. I think it's a version of capitalism, and one of the things we have to understand is there are many different types of capitalism, and it is a particular version of capitalism where particular interest groups have captured policy and captured government for their own self-interest. So that's where we're going with the argument. So part of what I need to do is to explain where this confusion of terminology has arisen. And I'm going to do that with a little exercise talking about Britain. And I'm going to talk about Britain before and after the Industrial Revolution. So here is Britain in 1701 with a population estimated around 6 million people. At this time in 1701, the vast majority of the people would be living in the countryside. The largest city, which was London, would be possibly around 100,000, 200,000 people. And the map of population density, because you have a scale up there of population density, the darker it means more people per square mile. You can see there are very few people with over 500 per square mile, very few places with that. And basically, very simplistically, this map is a reflection of soil fertility. Okay, it's feudal times. The main predominant economy is farming, and it's organized politically and economically under a, basically, I'm simplifying, a feudal system. So you get more um, out of the land where the soil is fertile. So you have fertile areas like the Severn Valley here. These areas around here, which are rich post-glacial soils down here, and um, in certain parts of the country, there, there are no factories, there are no railways, there are no mines to speak of. Okay? It's a pre-industrial society, and it's run politically, economy, in its political economy, it is what we loosely call feudal. Okay? I'll come, come back to that. Notice, just for interest, this area of South Wales here, which is empty, and central Scotland there, which is pre pretty empty. There is people living there because this is a lowland area with farming. But look what happens in a minute when we come to look at the post-industrial period. Now, society at this time is organised on the basis of a feudal hierarchical structure, very rigid, in which the people down here, the people who actually do the work on the farming... Sorry about these kind of funny pictures, but it's just a way to get you to the point where you've got this rigid hierarchy with the power of the monarch at the top, supported by lords who are then supported by knights and then the people who actually do the work are down here. Now this system <coughs> is um, uh, one which is very rigid. So if you live down here and farm the land, you can't go anywhere else. You are tied to that land. That is where you live and die. That's, that's your life. You can't move. So although you're not a slave, 
you are pretty well controlled by being in that. And if you went somewhere else, there's nothing to do. You can't get any land anywhere else. So you're in this very rigid um, hierarchical structure. So this is, if you like, the, the, the feudal system which dominates at that time. And the point of this is to show that this doesn't last. The Industrial Revolution is part of the protest process by which this is overthrown. So by the time we get to, uh, sorry, 1191, that's it meant to be 1911. 1911, 1911, um, you see that the map has changed considerably. The first thing is that you've got a much larger population. And this is from a census, so we, that's reasonably accurate, 33 million people. It's gone up quite a lot in the space of 200 years. You've got lots of areas of very dense population, over 500 per square mile. And you can see that this area, which was empty, you couldn't even farm there, is now one of the most densely populated parts of Britain. And that's because it's coal mining and, and steel making and industry, which has grown up as part of the Industrial Revolution. You can see that London, which was also an industrial um, uh, city, is very dense. There are some remnants of the benefits of farming in, in there. But you can see you've got a very, very different map. And this map is basically determined by the effects of the Industrial Revolution, coal mining, and the arrival of industry. And you can see that central Scotland, which was empty, is now very densely populated by people in coal, in iron making, in shipbuilding, and so on. So this is what we mean by the Industrial Revolution. So we now have factories, mines, railways, roads, and so on, which were completely absent here. And so when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, that is what we mean. It's also a demographic shift of considerable importance. Now, why am I saying this? Because the class structure that you had under feudalism is now completely different. The feudal system has gone. You have a new set of classes. You have, in, in stereotypical Marxist analysis, you have the bourgeoisie, you have the proletariat and a small middle class at this time. And the economy is dominated by manufacturing and exports and um, uh, mining. And very, very different times. Now, this, how did this transition happen? If we look at the last 500 years, we see that in Europe, um, in Britain in particular Europe, we have the collapse of feudalism and its replacement by capitalism. So one system supplants the other. You need different people to run capitalism than you do in feudalism. So the old lords, by and large, go out of the picture. Although in Britain, they don't go completely out of the picture. They do more in France, where <coughs> some of them lose their heads. In Britain, that didn't happen so much. So we have a much more fluid class structure in this transition, to the extent that we still have the extraordinary situation of a second house of parliament, which is called the House of Lords which also has 32 bishops sitting in it, which represents the fact that we never separated um, politics and the church. So we have this, this transition. Now, there is a, another part to this, which is I'm not going to have time to talk about today, which is overseas and what became the colonies. Now, I don't have time to talk about that, but there is a huge debate in economic history about whether this transition could have happened without the exploitation of the colonies, especially through slavery. I don't have time to get into that. Um, that there is, you can get into that if, if you want. I tend to think that you could have had this. It might have been slower without that. But certainly, this was part of the globalization process, which took capitalism, certainly, to other parts of the world. Now, I've done a much more complex version of this diagram um, and I've chosen 500 years because it's, this is basically the beginnings of European globalization. Globalization which is dominated by the European powers that became the uh, colonial powers, the empires of Europe. I've chosen that 500 year period. And here we see in more empirical detail the way in which the feudal classes diminish and they break down until we have a few feudal remnants, like we still have the House of Lords, we have the monarchy, which means that we still have things in Britain which are um, of feudal type. Okay? Uh, but by and large, these have been supplanted by the emergence of capitalism and the, the rise of the, uh, the manufacturing and mining systems, 
which um, are, I'm not going to have time to talk about. If we bring in the overseas there, we then see that the global exploration, the East India Company, plunder and slavery and so on, plantation crops, raw materials, then Britain has to manufacture, it has to export its manufactures and so on. So we have this transition. The key point I want you to get is that this society is very different from this in terms of its politics and economics. The capitalist system is emerged as a different mode of production. So in this, I'm going to use the concept um, of mode of production, which is um, um, used by Marxists. Marxism, I think it's a very useful, powerful way. You don't have to be a Marxist to use it. it it's, it's, a, it's a way of understanding how all societies work. And I won't have time to go into great detail, but we can perhaps have discussion about it afterwards. To illustrate what I mean by a mode of production, I'm going to talk about... Uh, oh, sorry, I've forgotten. I've got to talk about the Enlightenment. In the middle of this process, we have the thing which is called the Enlightenment. Now, I've put it in quote marks because there is a degree of chauvinism that goes on in understanding of the Enlightenment because it seems to... Many people seem to assume that it was a purely... European white thing, because we have an earlier enlightenment in the Middle East with Arab culture and civilization, which derives a lot of its learning from um, other cultures that predated it. And the reason we know so much about the, the science and the medicine and the philosophy of those periods is because it was transmitted to us partly through Arab civilization, through Spain, and also through the through the Greeks. But I, I I'm being ironic about using this notion of the Enlightenment, it isn't exclusively a white European thing. But what comes with it is some things which, if you like, the thinking of the Enlightenment is what you need to run capitalism. Okay? The Enlightenment thinking does not fit with feudalism. The Enlightenment thinking is about a separation of church and state. It's about an understanding that the church should not interfere in matters of government but we'd had a thousand years in which the church was used by the powerful to help them to administer and run and terrify the population into thinking that they were under God's eye, that they, were, uh, they had to worry about what God was thinking about them because they would be punished if they didn't do it. So the church uh, and religion was extremely useful to feudal society to reinforce what became for some monarchs the divine right to rule. Some monarchs claimed that they had God's right to rule. And this was a, a ideologically a very powerful, uh, powerful thing. The other thing that happened with the Enlightenment, which was, of course, in, in philosophy, theology, but also in science, and the emergence of science as a way to explain natural ph phenomena, which previously were explained as being the result of God or God's action. So science begins to explain the um, geology of the world, the, the reason why you find certain things in places, it understands the chemistry and it becomes possible to make things using chemical reactions which could not be used before. So it becomes possible to actually make artificial substances or modify natural substances to be useful for construction. So iron and then steel, uh, making batteries, uh, the possibility of electricity, all come out of the science that is parallel to this. And all of those things are necessary for capitalism, but were completely unnecessary for feudalism. So we have the way of thinking emerging different, and then we have the social science, because we have to explain why has this change happened and what is capitalism. So we have the emergence of social science, beginning with people like Adam Smith, but I, I, others before Adam Smith, because we've heard of him, where we are trying to understand capitalism and why some countries are, are different from from other countries. So to understand this idea of modes of production, I'm using a very simple model here of games that we play. You've all probably played this. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to suggest that modes of production have two basic components to them. One is hardware and the other, other is software. Okay. All societies are composed of things you can touch, like iron, Factories, roads, railways, people. It's made of things that you can, are physical things. And it's made up of <coughs> rules and relationships which organize how those things operate. Okay? And the crucial difference between different modes of production is that there are different things in each mode of production. 
you don't have factories or, or mines in feudalism, but you also have different systems of organizing it, liter almost literally like software. So your hardware is your computer, the, the, the um, screen, the keyboard, uh, uh, and the mouse and so on. They will not work without software. Now, each society has different software which makes its different hardwares work and operate together. Now, the, those rules are normally captured by the powerful so that the powerful design the rules for their own benefit. Okay? And that is why what neoliberalism is a particular form of capitalism in which those who have been able to become empowered at the top of our hierarchy are able to design the rules that benefit how capitalism works for them. So they've redesigned the software of capitalism for their own particular benefit. So it's a particular form of the mode of production which is serving their needs. So in this, hardware is very simple. You've got the board, you've got the dice that you throw, you've got the counters that you move around, and there's very simple rules. The software is very simple. If you land on a snake, you go down. If you land on a ladder, you go up. And the one to reach the end is, is the winner. Very, very simple hardware and, and software. If we compare it with another game, Monopoly. How many of you have played Monopoly? Probably everyone. Yeah, and it, isn't it wonderful? At Christmas, you know, lots of people play at Christmas with their family. And you, you're playing this game with all your family and your aunt, aunt is there. You haven't seen her for a, for a year. And you realize she plays this game and she wipes the floor with you. And you, you realize this nice old lady is actually a real cow. And, so, and, and, uh, and, and anyway, so the hardware is the board, the, these counters. This is an updated one. You've got a laptop here and a mobile phone. And the money, the hotels, the houses, and so on. So the hardware is much more co complicated. There's more of it. And the software that manages this, have you ever tried to explain to a 10-year-old the rules of Monopoly? It's not easy. So the software is much, much more difficult as well. Now, I'm not going to have time to talk about it today, but what happens when a society that runs this system meets a society that runs that system? So this is basically the process of colonization, is that people that want society to be like this arrive in and dominate a society that looks like this, and whose rules win? Okay. So we have the idea of the mode of production. The mode of production is a way of producing. It's just jargon for the way the system by which production happens. And every society has a mode of production. Uh, we have things which are, in the Marxist jargon, are called the forces of production. It's the things you can touch. It's the hardware. It, things and people. Factories, roads, blah, blah, blah. And then there are the linkages, the software, the social relations. In the jargon, they're called the social relations of production. They're the rules that enable the game to be played of the, the way in which the hardware is used. And there's basically two types of rules here. Very important that we understand these rules. Two types of software. The first is who is allowed to own things and who is forbidden from owning things. And this is usually based on class, also gender, and sometimes ethnicity. So for, certainly for gender, in many parts of the world, women are forbidden from owning land. So that's one of the rules that you would have in many societies around a particular rule of ownership. In um, capitalist society, ordinary workers are not allowed to own factories. Okay? Um, so I, I'm going to have to speed up and go. The other crucial rule is Assuming that this society produces a surplus, and magically it always produces a surplus for a certain group of people, okay, what is the rule that says who should get that and how much they should get? What is their share of that? So that is also a taxation rule in terms of how the surplus that society generates, how it is allocated, and we will be coming, coming back to that in a minute. I'm going to do this in a much more complex way on this diagram. Don't worry about too much about the, the big diagram. I'm going to focus on two parts of it. So this is the economy, the primary, the mining, the uh, agriculture, the industry, service sector, and so on. And that gives rise to your GDP. Your GDP is then divided three ways, between the net profits to corporations, taxes, which are collected, and the net wages that go to 
to the workers. Simple so far. If you are getting your wage, then you can spend it. Is there any guarantee that your wage enables you to have a sufficient life in terms of adequate food, health care, education, and so on? It depends. It depends how society is organized, what the level of the wage is. Is your wage the minimum wage? Is it the living wage? Is it um, commanded by supply and demand? So you can demand £100,000 for your job as opposed to £20,000 for your job. So all of those, those things are going on there. The, the hope is that your wages and your spending enable you to have a decent life, what we call human development. Adequate food, nutrition, um, education, uh, and so on. But that depends entirely on everyone having a job, a decent job, and it giving you enough money to spend to have a decent life. Okay? So this is not... We will be coming back to that. The other path to human development is where that does not satisfy people's needs, where this does not work. Everyone else is dependent on government policy and expenditure. So Now, obviously, not all government expenditure goes on human development, but some of it goes on welfare spending, is loosely defined, I'll come back to it, which then enables you to have human development to satisfy your needs. So if your wages do not enable you to be, um, have good level of development, then you're dependent on it redistribution. Basically, it's, it's an issue of redistribution. Now, I'm not going to talk about all, all of this, um, what, um, uh, except this very simple feedback loop, which is the benefit of human development is that it produces educated, healthy, trained people who are then able to start up new enterprises or be employable. So it's a feedback loop, which is what generates economic growth, supposedly, adding, of course, adding to that research and development and investment from, uh, from, from profits. Um, we also have up here a couple of additions to put in foreign aid, NGOs, and uh, now we have to put in philanthropists. But what I w basically want to do is to label this as pathway B and label the other one as pathway A and talk a bit about what the significance is of there being these two pathways, because I think they are quite significant. Now, the argument here for pathway B, which has, if you like, big government and taxation that pays for welfare, is that it is profitable and good for society. So... This idea is that if you have this system here where people's wages cannot pay for their education or their health care, and the vast majority of people in the world cannot pay for their education or health care, they try to, but they're reliant on it being from, uh, well, you, you know the story. So the point about this is that it is profitable for capitalism to operate in this loop, and this is what is, was, is loosely called um, welfare capitalism or social democracy, social democratic capitalism, in which the argument is that the capitalists are satisfied with this because it gives them a good income. Cap capitalism is profitable. There is no problem when the system was operating like this before neoliberalism. There was no problem of profitability. Interestingly, the heads of corporations uh, um, in the 1950s and 60s there, the ratio of the highest paid in a corporation to the average salary in a corporation was around 20 to 1. Okay? It is now 230 to 1. Okay? With no necessary increase in profitability. In fact, some of the people who get the most are running loss-making companies. Like Uber and um, uh, WeWork uh, and, and so on. So... You know, the, the, there is no relationship between being paid enormous amounts of money and it being profitable. So, but that is one of the, the, the lies that emerges with, with neoliberalism. In this pathway here, if people do not get enough wages, um, they cannot live well, what happens to them? Well, this is very visible in developing countries because those people are expendable. They die young. They die hungry. Their mothers die in childbirth, etc. But we now see it on the streets of Brighton. 
when this does not work. We see hundreds of people living on the streets in Brighton. So we've got this. This is where we're going with neo neoliberalism. And I'll explain that a bit more. But just to um, another way of representing pathway B is that you've got the GDP coming from the bottom. There is a government share of that, which is derived mainly from taxes. And that is then divided into what you could call the social allocation ratio. Um, and this has been inspired by the 1996 Human Development Report. There's a very, I found it a very, very good report, 1996 Human Development Report. Some of this I've stolen from that. Well worth looking at. Um, and my big diagram is actually a modification of one of the diagrams that used in there. So how big should this be? And then how big should that be as a share of it? Neoliberalism wants to shrink that and shrink that and put everyone, as many people as possible, onto pathway A, okay? And not have a, such a large pathway B. So that the people become responsible for themselves. Remember the first statement? Neoliberalism, conservatism is about individual responsibility. If you're poor, it's your fault. It's not societal. So um, uh, this is just a, a, an added one, is that some of these, where countries are deficient in this, that's where donor assistance comes in to some extent. So for example, the Ugandan, I don't know if it's still true today, but the Ugandan health budget, it, about half of it was being paid by DFID. So it's added in to government revenue. We, we haven't got time to go into those arguments, except that a few years ago, Amartya Sen wrote a, 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 a newspaper article which said, why does India not have universal health care? So why is the Indian government not collecting taxes to improve the health care of its citizens? And um, it's because they are not collecting enough tax through corporations or individuals to inc increase the size of this. I would say because they don't give a damn. Many of them do not give a damn about their people. So, um, so that, that's, we, we'll have to move on. Now, you can get these slides. If you, if you put down your email, I'll send you the slides. I'm not going to have time to talk about this. This is a bit more of an explanation of um, uh, pathways A and B. Now, what happens under pathway B is that it, you have the allocation of production assets. Well, in all societies, you have, a software, you have a software rule that determines who owns what. So who owns how much land? Who has the right to own a factory? Who has the right to own a railway company? Those are software rules that exist in those societies. So each society has a set of rules that allocate resources which are used for livelihoods between different people. The software rules also determine the distribution of income through wage levels and taxation. It also determines the level of what in Britain we call the social wage, which is education, health care, social housing, we call it council housing in Britain, and the universal benefits such as an unemployment benefits and so on, which everyone has a right to. These are universal be benefits. If you live in Britain, you have a right to them. Um, and then social protection, which we have a lot of uh, doing work on this in IDS, which is targeted benefits for particular groups, which I'm not going to have time to talk about very much, but I think you all know what I mean by that. Then we have the issue now with climate change is where do funds come from? <coughs> from the, the rich countries that have caused global warming to help poor countries overcome the problems of global warming, which is called adaptation. Now this adaptation funding is practically zero at the moment. <coughs> and I'm not gonna have time to talk about that until nearer to the end. So um, these are all determined by the software rules of society. And they're de determined, therefore, by the systems of power that operate in society. And so, for example, in much of the world, you still have feudalism. So, or forms of unequal land tenure, which many people call semi-feudalism. So, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, uh, to a significant extent in, in parts of Indonesia, in the Philippines... And so on, you have people living in pyramid structures in which the, the country and the village is run by somebody at the top, and down at the bottom you have very, very little, few options. Okay? Now, this was a political problem for the West 
in the 20th century because apart from the two world wars, the biggest social unrest and the most people were killed in revolutions which are about unequal land tenure. They were revolutions about bad landlords owning most of the land. So you had the uh, Mexican Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, Vietnam, Cuba, uh, the one in Nepal which didn't go very well. These are all revolutions about unequal land in feudal systems in which the poor at the bottom in the end said enough and rebelled against these systems of power. Now, um, in, in, as well as that, you had two pathways about, uh, of that in the uh, 20th century. The other pathway was the West, Western countries, deliberately forcing land reform on some countries. So South Korea and Taiwan were forced to get rid of their landlords and in industrialize and become modern urban societies by especially the United States insisting that they buy out the landlords to end feudalism, enter the real world. And why was the West interested in doing that? Because they did not want more dominoes to fall over. They did not want Taiwan and South Korea to go like China and Vietnam. Okay, and North Korea had already gone. So South Korea was kind of in the front line. And um, interestingly, it's much less known about, the Americans did the same in Japan. Because Japan was what you could call a feudal country. And MacArthur, who was the um, head of the armed forces in the Pacific during the war, he then became the governor of Japan and instituted land reform. And as you can see, the language here is very much like the American Revolution and the Bill of Rights. It's about getting rid of a system which is oppressive and exploitative. It's insisting on the idea of dignity and rights and freedom. So it's quite interesting the kind of crossover of the terminology. There was this kind of awareness in the State Department. They needed good social scientists who actually understood the rural economy. Uh, possibly a bit better than happens today. But basically, um, so power systems determine, so in much of the world, the allocation of the assets, land in particular, is due to these systems of power. Now, um, what I want to emphasize is that in this model of pathway A and B, the goal of changing the rules under neoliberalism is basically to shrink this pathway. Sorry, it's gone. Maybe it comes up in a later slide. I was doing this until late in the night, and I might have got some of them in the wrong order. But basically, just to say that the goal of neoliberalism is to shrink taxes, to shrink the government, and to shrink the amount of welfare spending. So that's the role of neoliberalism, and to push as many people as possible onto path A, which is the one where you take individual responsibility for your life. See? Okay. Now, this neoliberalism... What it has, has it involved? Um, well, one of its favourite things is the public-private partnership, which I won't have time to go into, but uh, highly dubious and lots of criticisms of it. But basically, neoliberalism involves the privatisation of utilities. So in Britain and many countries, the um, water supply, the collection of uh, garbage, the electricity supply... Um, gas supply, all of these have been privatised under Thatcher and her um, um, subsequent governments into profit-making organisations. So they're now designed to deliver profit for their shareholders rather than to provide public service. Now, when I did my first economics, these were all defined as public goods. These were public goods and these utilities were supposed to be available on the basis of right to people at um, reasonable prices and so on. We all, we, I'm not going to have time, but this also involves the stealth privatisation of the National Health Service. This, um, I'm not going to have time to talk about all these, but the privatisation of government functions has been quite important as well. So, for example, government, key government functions, like the forensic service in Britain, has been um, privatised. And these private laboratories that do the, in, in, you know, the DNA investigations and all of those, they are not doing it very well. They're profit-oriented. They want to minimise their costs. Some of them have gone bankrupt, and some of them have been proved to be completely incompetent. And many criminal cases have collapsed because they've not provided adequate evidence for criminal cases. In other words, bad people have got off because the government privatised the forensic system. And 
you have the same problems with the probation system, social care, and so on, which I'm not going to have time to talk about it. We have outsourcing. Now, outsourcing is a primary ideology of um, neoliberalism, and this involves, in particular, cleaning services and catering services in an organization will be put out to tender to a private organization. So in the university here, all the cleaners and all the catering staff are from a private company which is contracted to the university to provide its services. And their conditions therefore suffer. They used to be employees of the university. The reason they've done it is the university can save money and the employees are treated like dirt. And they are starting to, well, they've been starting for quite a while now to strike. There have been some serious strikes by them unionizing uh, over this. Uh, it also involves deregulation or cutting red tape, which is a favorite thing. And I have a friend who's doing work with the World Bank who says regulations save lives. And he's working on building codes where deregulation by the World Bank and others is trying to cut building codes which make people safe. He's trying to demonstrate that building codes are absolutely vital to saving people's lives. And Milton Friedman had a wonderful, he's one of the pioneers of proponents of neoliberalism. He was interviewed Quite a few years ago now, he said, building regulations are an un unfortunate constraint on the profitability of the construction industry. Interesting, isn't it? Until your house falls down in an earthquake. Um, it also involves cutting taxes for rich and corporations. And um, I'll just show this, then give those who have to... How many people have to leave for two o'clock? Okay, so I'll give you a chance for... Um, uh, uh, no, I'll give you a chance for questions and comments now and come back to the video afterwards. So anyone want to ask anything or say anything, who's got to leave? Only those who've got to leave. Anyone? No? Okay, if you want the slides um, and the link to the um, talk, then send me an email uh, and I'll, I'll uh, send it out. No comments, questions? Okay. So this, some of you, I hope, saw in January. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go then. You talked about Amrit Sen, uh, uh, you know, mentioning about India's uh, lack of uh, willingness to reform on the public health care. Uh, to be fair to Indian various federal governments and central governments, they have made an effort uh, to, live, uh, to make affordable public health care, yep. especially in the federal side. Yep. Uh, and working towards the lower strata, which is the kind of the Dalit, or, or uh, you know, you need to have a particular bill of poverty like that. Yeah. So they're, they're trying to work towards it uh, in terms of that, and, and to an extent it is working. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, maybe 10 years back, 10, 20 years back, uh, not 10 years back, 20 years back it would be a different scenario, but the last 20 years as much since the economy has grown, because it's not because they want to do it, it's because the voters demand to do it. <laughs> but it's driven by the demand of votes, and because they control the votes, the poor. Uh, and they, they, the awareness of healthcare and primary education is, is forcing them to create these policies. Okay. I think the interesting comment there is they don't necessarily want to do it, but they've seen it as an election, exactly. uh, an election thing. And that's my point, is about whether neoliberalism has provided leaders who actually care about their people. Mm -hmm. So that's the point I'm, I'm trying to make, is that many leaders will get away with the minimum possible because they don't really care, but they may be forced to in, into it. So Boris Johnson yesterday was forced to say that these things people are saying about the National Health Service are not true. We are genuinely trying to improve it because he is worrying about getting, getting votes. And they banned fracking because they have a number of key marginal seats in rural places where fracking is threatened. So yes, I, ac I accept your point, but I think my point still stands. It's about the motivation. The difference between welfare capitalism that I spoke about before neoliberalism, and this is the major difference in the change in the rules and perceptions, is that we had, certainly in Britain uh, and, and certainly in some other European countries, we had a capitalist class who thought that capitalism should run for the benefit of all. Okay, that, that was the social contract. Going back to social contract theory, the theory after the Second World War was that you, you had to run capitalism for the benefit of all. You had to have a healthy, well-educated population, and we're quite happy with that. If you're a capitalist, you're quite happy with that because you've got a good population to work for you. So, so this is the difference, that people are now expendable. 
You, know, you, you get what you want, you need less and less workers, etc. But thank you for that. Anyone need to leave? Now is a good time. Unless you've got a comment. Yeah. yeah. Have you got to leave? Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> So yeah. the relevance of neoliberal capitalism, neoliberalism, and and uh, and you're saying, well, it's about what the leaders think or what leaders want. Yeah. But that, in my view, has always been the case. Yeah. Uh, that was also the case after the war and the sort of social democratic period in Sweden and so on. We have bad and good leaders. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's never just about what leaders want. Yeah. What is it about? If, if I could interpret your question, what I think you're really asking is why did it shift from welfare capitalism or social dem democratic capitalism so to neoliberalism? Is the, yeah. the fall of the, well, in short, the fall of the Berlin Wall and, and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of alternative ideologies, uh, whereas mm -hmm. in the 20th century we tended to have we had beliefs about ideologies and debates about mm -hmm. what's the right thing to do in society. And I'm simplifying. After 89, mm -hmm. uh, those debates ended in a, in a big way after maybe Thatcher and the neoliberal, uh, and with, combined with growth, that the idea that we were all heading for Nirvana. Yeah, but, but I think the, the problem with that is that the neoliberalism takes hold and is victorious, uh, not completely victorious, significant inroads are made long before 1989. I mean, the privatization of the British utilities comes long before that. Um, the, the privatization program predates 89. I think you're right that there is an impact of 89 around the argument of the end of history, that I idea that there is no alternative. But, but what that doesn't demonstrate is there was an alternative. Welfare capitalism um, was trashed because it was thought to be too expensive. So the you had the argument that if we want to run capitalism that way, our profitability is challenged. It is challenged by trade unions, which erode our profitability, and the smashing of the trade unions was a key part of the Thatcher um, uh, agenda in order to um, redress the balance between wages as, and, um, and profits. And, um, but the, the issue of what happened, I don't think there's any particular individual drivers. I think Reagan and Thatcher become... Um, individuals who are, are captured, they are captured by those who want to influence how governments behave. And, uh, and I think the, the role of the individual is quite interesting around the kind of the zeitgeist. I mean, I think what we see now in Britain and, and the United States is that people who promote capitalism don't necessarily want Boris Johnson or Trump in power, but they were kind of clowns that had to come forward to enable those parties to stay um, uh, stay in, in the running for a significant period. But this is a huge discussion which we won't have time for, for now, which we'll have to come back to. So if I could, if you're able to stay till the end, could I take your comment at the end? Would that be all right? Yes? Good, thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to show you this because it pe became kind of iconic about the debates and the discussions. This was at the Davos meeting. Some of you probably saw it. This is my first time at Davos and... Uh, and I find it quite a bewildering experience, to be honest. I mean, 1,500 private jets have flown in here to hear Sir David Attenborough speak about, you know, how we're wrecking the planet. And uh, I mean, I hear people talk in the language of participation and justice and equality and transparency. But then, I mean, almost no one raises the real issue of tax avoidance, right? And of the rich just not paying their fair share. I mean, it feels like I'm at a firefighters fighters conference and no one's allowed to speak about water. Right? <laughs> there, was, there was only one panel, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had two. You're the second well, of well, our wait, panels. There, there so was only one panel. Let's go there. One. one panel hidden away in the media center that was actually about tax avoidance. Yes. I, was about, I was one of the 15 participants. So <laughs> something needs to change here. I mean, ten, 10 years ago, the World Economic Forum asked the question, what must industry do to prevent a broad social backlash? The answer is very simple. Just stop talking about philanthropy. 
and start talking about taxes. Mm -hmm. Taxes, taxes. We need to, I mean, just two days ago, there was a billionaire in here, uh, what's his name, Michael Dell. And uh, he asked the question like, name me one country where a top marginal tax rate of 70% has actually worked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a historian. The United States, that's where it has actually worked. In the 1950s, during <laughs> Republican President Eisenhower, you know, the war veteran, the top marginal tax rate in the U.S. was 91% mm -hmm. for people like Michael Dell. You know, the top estate tax for people like Michael Dell was more than 70%. I mean, this is not rocket science. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid philanthropy schemes. We can invite Bono once more, but come on, it's, we gotta be talking about taxes. That's it, taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is bullshit, in, in my opinion. We have a tax system that leaks so much that allows $170 billion of money every year to be taken to tax havens and to be denied the developing countries that need that money most. So we have to look at the business model and we have to look at the role of governments to tax and plow back money into people's lives. I have to say, honestly, this is a very one-sided panel. The U.S. <laughs> basically has the lowest unemployment rate ever, the lowest black unemployment rate ever, the lowest youth unemployment ever. Uh, we've actually reduced poverty around the world. No one's talking about that at all. So I'd like for the panel to talk about beyond taxes, which every one of you have talked about. The only thing you've talked about in this whole panel on inequality, what can we really do to solve and help solve inequality over time beyond taxes? The gentleman who talked about, who said we've just talked taxes and that jobs are there and there's low and unemployment rates are low. Let me tell you something. We're talking about jobs, but the quality of those jobs. And we also work with poultry workers in the richest country in the world, the United States. Poultry workers. These are women who are cutting the chickens and packing them, and we buy them in the supermarkets. Dolores, one woman we work with there, told us that she and her co-workers have to wear diapers to work because they are not allowed toilet breaks. This is in the richest country in the world. That's not a dignified job. Those are the jobs we are being told about, that globalization is bringing jobs. The quality of the jobs matter. It matters. These are not jobs of dignity. In many countries, workers no longer have a, a voice. They are not allowed to unionize. They are not allowed to negotiate for, work, for salaries. So we're talking about jobs, but jobs that bring dignity. We are talking about healthcare. The World Bank has told us that 3.4 billion people who earn $5.5 a day are on the verge, are just a medical bill away from sinking into poverty. They don't have health care. They are just a crop failure away from sinking back into poverty. They have no crop insurance. So don't tell me about low levels of unemployment. You are counting the wrong things. You're not counting dignity of people. You're counting exploited people. I, I want So, interestingly, there was a figure in the paper for Britain last week that there's eight million people in Britain who are in work and are so poor that they have to get help from food banks. They're working. They're in these shit jobs that Winnie is talking about. Okay, so um, cutting, uh, it's about cutting taxes. Uh, privatization of schools, I'm running out of time, but in Britain and the United States in particular, there are huge ideological moves to privatize schools. I mean, we're talking about primary and secondary schools. This is um, part of the uh, agenda to hand them over to, at the moment, relatively small corporations. And then we have the corporatization of the universities. Half of the staff in British universities are casual workers. Half, nearly half. In the United States, it's half. Okay? Universities are now corporations which are trying to maximize their income by allowing as many people to come as possible. So the qualifications to come to British universities now have almost completely eradicated for undergraduates. It, it, you don't need good grades in your A-levels to go to university. Each university is competing to try and get as many students as possible, which is why we see here a building boom on this campus, 
with the need to provide more space because each university is competing with every other university in corporate competition to do that and outsourcing its, uh, its cleaning and catering in order to uh, minimise its costs. There's another issue here which I hope to give another talk on, which is how this has affected universities in terms of its research and the research we carry out. My argument here is that because we are all universities and IDS reliant on funding from different kinds of donors, a lot of it from government, the way in which we take the money is already framed around ways of thinking which are not necessarily addressing the causes of the problems. Okay? The framing of how we discuss poverty, marginality uh, and, and hunger is already framed around ways of thinking which are convenient to the government and are not truly independent research opportunities. And I, I think this is a... a um, another way in which neoliberalism has influenced science in a very detrimental way. Um, um, oh, I, I didn't say on deregulation, it's now coming out that you all heard about the crashes of the Boeing 737 MAX, the two crashes. It's now coming out that that was prime, uh, significantly, those crashes were a part of the reduction of regulation by the FAA of the aerospace industry in the United States. So deregulating the industry has led to systems in the manufacture of that aircraft which made it unsafe. Um, we could look, talk about Grenfell Tower, we could talk about many, many things here which I'm going to run out of time. So I want to move from, from this, oh here's some more examples of tax evasion, avoidance. Uh, this was in February this year, this guy moved to Mon Monaco so he could be outside the British jurisdiction in order to save four billion. You think, what is his income? If he's trying to save four billion in taxes, what's his actual income? And why does anyone need that much money? What would you do with that much money? I mean, this is the ludicrous situation that we got into. And then USB, which is a major, it's a Swiss bank, isn't it? or Swiss-based <coughs> bank, was done for fraud because they were helping people to avoid paying taxes in France. So another thing that neoliberalism has done is to make it... Um, easier to be criminal and to avoid tax and um, 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 a number of the big banks um, HSBC, Barclays have been fined uh, huge sums of money, hundreds of millions of dollars for laundering money for, for criminals including drug cartels and for manipulating foreign exchange systems to enable them to make more, more profit. Um, and so on. I mean, there's endless stories about, uh, about that. Um, so a guide to the terminology. Neo is Greek for new. Uh, liberalism, what do we mean by that? Uh, I'll explain a bit of that. It's, it's, liberalism is used by many to mean contradictory things. But the key thing is that how you think about it is very often class-based. So neoliberalism, basically, the simple story is it's the new version of 19th century liberalism, which we call laissez-faire. So laissez-faire capitalism was let it happen without interference from the government. Uh, laissez-faire was the um, motto of the free trade ideas of 19th century uh, uh, capitalism. So you, you run the economy without interference from government. And it argued that market forces could determine more or less anything that happened in the economy, and that was the way it should be run. And there's an interesting little footnote on that, which is the Irish famine of 1845 to 49, in which the initial response of the... Uh, at that time, Ireland was part of Britain. Uh, Ireland was actually a colony, but actually Britain claimed that it owned and ran Ireland. And the Irish famine happened. It killed one to one and a half million people. And the British government refused to intervene in terms of food aid because it said the market will solve this problem. And this is all on record from the, the Minister of Finance, who was called Lord Trevelyan at, at the time. I haven't got time to go. It's a fascinating story. Um, the, the idea was that the role of the state would be very restricted. And it's based on classical economics uh, around the idea of what's called economic man, which, of course, should be mankind, and the idea of homo economicus. And this idea is based on the... Um, the understanding that each person will want to maximise their income and each corporation will want to maximise their profits. 
And that is the driver of society. And if people are allowed to do that, then the, there will be the maximum benefit for all because that will rationally allocate resources in society and you will have the maximum utility of people. And that's also <laughs> underlying this idea of individual freedom in what I talked about in the United States. And um, I, I've talked about this already, um, uh, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, but basically, from this time, what does liberalism mean in terms of its meaning in, in language is that it's free from restraint in speech or action. In other words, it's a democratic principle, and here we have the first clue as to why it's related to the shift in the mode of production from feudalism to capitalism. Because all people who did not want feudalism, whether they were wannabe capitalists or wannabe free people who then became workers, all of those people wanted freedom from restraint of speech or action. In other words, there was unity amongst people against the restrictions of the feudal hierarchy. And what this means is that over the last 200 years, what has happened is that both of those sides of the different kinds of people who wanted freedom and liberty went themselves in different directions because each side could use that argument for freedom and liberty to promote their own class interest. So those who dominated the capitalism, capitalist system, like the Freedom Foundation and so on, they can argue that we need freedom and liberty to run the economy for the benefit of all, but each individual takes their responsibility. And the workers could say, we need freedom from the oppression by the state in order that we're allowed to form hum uh, trade unions and women are allowed to vote. Um, uh, uh, we should have decent housing, we should have decent education. So out of the opposition to feudalism, all, all sides, both sides, whichever you want to call it, all had an interest in promoting freedom and liberty. And that's where the terminology confusion comes from. From 200 years ago, in all sides wanting to draw on this as a, a legacy which they could use to, to make uh, for their rights. Um, so I'm skipping through these. You, if you want the slides, you can, um, you can get them and you can read them. Uh, so I'm going to skip. Um, so basically, to put a timeline on it, to make it simple, this period is laissez-faire, dominates up to the, towards the end of the 19th century. Market forces can resolve any problem, even the Irish famine. Um, but there is a ten tension here because one of the things that emerges is quite understandably that capitalism begins with many, many thousands of small family-owned businesses. And what happens, what emerges in the 19th century is the tendency towards monopolization. So by the end of the 19th century in the United States, you have the beginnings of legal restrictions on monopolization, the anti so-called antitrust laws, which are designed to try to take it back to a free market situation where there is fair and free comp competition on a more level playing field. And you've probably heard that the European Union still has, uh, has its own antitrust laws, which tries to minimize, it <laughs> uh, doesn't really work, um, uh, uh, monopolization. Um, then we have the emergence of the um, need to manage capitalism, the idea that you need a state which actually interfere, interferes and intervenes to manage the, the market imperfections and the social problems that emerge um, from it. And then from the 40s onwards, we have the emergence of the welfare state, which is consolidated in most Western countries. Keynesian economics becomes influential, so demand management is the key to Keynesian economics. That means if there is not enough jobs, the government will spend money to create jobs. So this is the idea of minimizing harm done to people, whereas the neoliberal view is that you maximize profits and that is reinvested to create jobs. Now, here we have the big lie of neoliberalism, because does neoliberalism want to have more jobs? No. It is investing in, in, in um, um, artificial intelligence and in robots and in all manner of ways in which you can reduce the number of jobs. So the argument that economic growth is what you need to provide jobs is proven by the lie that everything is going on to reduce the number of jobs. So you will not have the guarantee of having a job to and, and people become expendable. So from 1980, roughly speaking, 
when Thatcher and Reagan are at the height, uh, come into power, you have the vi victory of neoliberalism, which confirms the domination of the Chicago School, Milton Friedman, Hay Hayek, and so on. The state is regarded as harmful e to economic growth, is not a supporter of economic growth. Interestingly, though, if you want capitalism in South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore and um, a number of other countries, how do you do it? You foster it through state intervention. So all of those so-called, and the World Bank had the nerve to claim that those newly industrialized countries of the 60s and 70s were because of market forces. And that's a complete lie. They were the result of state intervention and states combining with corporations as in the South Korean chai bowls and in Japan with the links between corporations and financial systems and the Ministry of Finance. They were state interventions which created capitalism in those countries under state um, sponsorship. Um, uh, and interestingly, this is, is sometimes called market fundamentalism. In other words, markets should rule everything. But interestingly, very few people argue that you should have a free market in labor because you have to restrict immigration because otherwise you can't get the parties into power that you need to run the system that you want. So you can't have a party in Britain or the United States that will run the capitalism that you need if you allow a free market in labor because then people will not vote for you because they're anti-immigrant or some people are anti-immigrant and so on. So you have interesting interesting little footnotes there. Interestingly on that one, a, a tiny little footnote, is that in the 80s there was a part of the Conservative Party in Britain which was called the Young Conservatives. They were very young, radical, loud, shouty um, market fundamentalists. And they actually had a debate at one of their annual conferences as to why the labour market was not free like the others. They were advocating for free markets and everything else. And they actually had a debate about if we're true on this ideologically, then we should have a free market in labour. Quite, quite interesting. I'm going to um, skip through these. There are other slides here. I want to stop so you have a chance to ask questions. But the, this other slide here is to highlight the difference between economic growth and human development. Um, uh, a lot of that is very, very well known. Um, one key thing I do want to finish on, and that is how did neoliberalism get spread around the world? And one of the main tools um, was through the World Bank and the IMF through structural adjustment programs. So it's uh, this absolutely crucial that the privatization, the reduction of the size of the state, no need to collect taxes, things will be sold by market forces. This was sold around the world in the 80s and 90s um, as um, uh, an ideology, some call it a religion, that this was actually spread um, to developing countries, which means that you have the, this absorption and actually favoring this ideology in those countries. Now, the, the upshot is that in many of those countries, you have the arrival then of demagogues and kleptocrats who are favored by the rules, the software. The software that comes with the penetration of neoliberalism is a kind of software that benefits demagogues, kleptocrats, and dictators. So in Africa and Asia, parts of Latin America, you have the arrival of people who are in power, do not give up power, because they are pushing an ideology which is welcomed by the West. So I, I think I will have to stop there um, uh, in order that there is some time for you to have questions. So thank you very much. I'm having to chair it myself, so we've got a, a roving mic as well, so there and then there. And then you wanted to speak earlier, so yeah. Uh, no, there, there first, I think. Um, okay, so I'll try to, uh, to be very like, direct. Um, and probably like this question I shouldn't be asking here, but I will anyways. Um, I got a sense of an underlying assumption, or two assumptions. Um, first, if, if there is no neoliberalism, then there is... Sorry, I can't, the, the loudspeaker system is not very good. I can't really hear you properly. Oh, okay, so sorry. Again. So uh, if, if we're running by any other world order besides neoliberalism, there is a belief that 
leaders would be working for the good of the people. There's uh, a belief that what, sorry? Leaders, like an assumption yes. that leaders mm. would be working for yeah. the good of the people. Yes. So like the type of leaders that new liberalism put in place um, are actually not working for the good of the people, but throughout history, the, like this has rarely been the case, I can argue, um, no matter what other type of modes of production has been in place. Mm. And the other thing is, there's a lot of trust, like the other alternative that we have has a lot of implied trust in governments. And I come from Egypt, and like I can assure you that this is not the like this is not the alternative route we can take. Um, so as much as I, I agree hundred percent on all of these implications, especially while Egypt is going through the structural adjustments programs r right now, uh, but on the other hand, like if you leave it to the governments to provide these services, we might be much worse off. So. What alternative? Provi providing which services? Sorry, I missed that. Welfare. Welfare, Welfare services, yes. yes. Yeah. We've already seen it in increased taxations. Taxa uh, taxes have mm. tripled during the past years, mm. and spending on education and health have decreased. So, how, like, right. how to go about this? Yeah, I, I mean, I can't comment on Egypt because I know al almost nothing about the country. So it, it's difficult for me to make any, any useful comment in relation to that. Your first point is about the kind of leaders. My, my point about that is the contrast between what we had in the 50s and 60s in Europe and what we had from the 80s onwards. So it's the contrast between the kinds of lead, leaders that are thrown up. Uh, the idea of welfare capitalism was that you needed leaders who in this country were called, um, in the Conservatives, were called one-party Tories. What, sorry, one-nation Tories. They, they believed that the nation should be unified and uh, welfare capitalism was something they signed up for. In fact, when I was a, a kid, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party competed with television adverts. When there was a, going to be an election, they would each pledge that they were going to build 100,000 houses for social housing or 150, and they would compete with each other for how many houses they would build. Uh, that, of course, with the Tories after Thatcher went to zero, and in fact, minus because she allowed them to sell houses to, to people. So the housing stock for poor people diminished significantly. So my contrast is not about other periods of history. I think I demonstrated that in the 19th century we had some pretty awful leaders. So the contrast is between cap welfare capitalism, and I'm trying to demonstrate that, that is entirely possible, and there is no reason why it should not exist, of course, it won't be exactly the same as it was in the 50s and 60s. What I'm saying is there was, there was profitable capitalism that even capitalists might enjoy, okay, and, um, and, and what we've had since. So this system throws, I think this system throws a number of particular kinds of people into positions of power. One is psychopaths, and, and the other is criminals who have no morals, and, um, and also nerds. Um, like Zuckerberg, who um, do not understand, uh, have no empathy. They do not understand how to help to relate to people. So, so that is because the accident of neoliberalism is, is that it's coincided with the so-called tech industry and the possibility of Silicon Valley to develop new ways of making profit, which gives rise to the Steve Jobs and the Zuckerbergs, who are particular kinds of, of psychology which um, suits them to those jobs, and they, they rise to the top in that. I can't comment about Egypt, but then it, then it was here. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting and yeah. uh, entertaining uh, presentation. You said rightly that there is a difference between neoliberalism and globalization, but there is a link to and I think it's what I would call a perverse link because the notion uh, that is put forward by the multinationals and their governments, particularly the US, uh, has been that globalization has uh, made national borders irrelevant and that the world is now a unified economic space that should be, should be run uh, without any, any interference from national governments and states yeah. uh, and according to the rules of neoliberalism. And, and I think they're using international instruments, particularly trade agreements and investment agreements, to put forward that and yep. to move it forward. And there are some, some cases which are iconic, you see, and one has to do with 
climate change. You haven't mentioned the climate change uh, in your I in promised your two years, but I didn't. That's right, that's right. <laughs> but what, this is one directly relevant, you see, because one of the things that they've managed to do is to establish the principle that uh, foreign investors have a right to sue governments whenever there are uh, uh, national policies, rules, regulations, etc., yeah. uh, that uh, impinge on their profits. Yeah. And there is at the moment a case in this uh, sort of uh, kangaroo courts, you see, which are the, the, the World Bank uh, uh, exit uh, uh, courts. Uh, a, a company, a Swedish company in Germany, which is suing the, the German government, because the German government, after the, the, the Chernobyl disaster, decided to do away with the nuclear power uh, yep. by the year 2022. Yep. Uh, and these companies had invested, and they are suing now for $5 billion, you see in compensation because they say this is an expropriation. The fact that you yeah. now don't want nuclear power means that our investment is now worth nothing. So. And it's very likely going to get money from that. You see. Yeah. So my point is that we have to be aware of the fact that these instruments, uh, these, these agreements, which are in principle appear to be quite benign, you see, yeah. uh, 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 trade and investment agreements, are really in effect the vehicles for, for neoliberalism yeah. to become yeah. globalized. Yeah, I think that's very, very good and important. And in a, in a sense, it's also a way in which they're changing the software rules for their own benefit. So I think that's very helpful. Thank you. I, I think it's there for, for David. Well, I feel well filled up. Yeah. That was a tour de force. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me right back to when I started development economics in the late 1960s. <coughs> and these stories about uh, the market developing Taiwan and South Korea were just emerging. They were treated as a branch of international economics where government was good, it uh, was bad, and so on. But I felt right at the end that the box neoliberalism was empty. I'll tell you why I think that. Mm. In the late 60s, around May, lots of us in North America doing PhDs were doing very, very highly mathematical theses with a whole stack of data. And when we finished, we wanted to go away and work out a social story, a political story, to go with the economic analysis. In Development economics is an excellent example in um, <clears throat> Arthur Lewis with his model of terms of trade. He had a story about the village, a t story about the uh, uh, subsistence wage, and a story about how profits were shipped out of those countries, and it was good economics that, that went together. Now, if you go way, way to the end of your talk, to climate change, how else can you talk about climate change other than go to good neoclassical economics, which talks about the goods that we eat and the bads that are the CO2 and so on. And I just think that there is a huge, huge amount of structural and neoclassical economics which can be used in parallel with your lovely descriptive history uh, which I enjoyed so much. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. There and then there. Tim. Hi. Thank you so much for a very insightful discussion. And so I'm just trying to contextualize this in, um, for my country, Pakistan, and other countries like India, developing countries, where the public sector is now increasingly moving towards outsourcing the healthcare ser uh, services in the system, particularly the primary healthcare service, which has actually, so for example, in Pakistan, you look at Punjab and Sindh, you see that the, uh, the provincial government has spent increasingly on outsourcing the healthcare services, which has actually uh, led to some improved outcomes, particularly in for like women and people are actually using those services. So I'm just wondering how that, uh, what implications it has for neoliberalism in that context where you see that you see some positive in outcomes. Yeah. Hmm. I, th I mean, of course, I don't know your country or, or that process either. I think everything is context specific. And 
we can all imagine countries where the healthcare service is, is very poor and, change, and where, I mean, I've been to many local government offices in Uganda, in Bangladesh, in India, where it's barely functioning because the people are underpaid, they are not motivated to do a good job. And we know this happens in schools, and I, I know less about clinics, but I imagine that it happens in clinics. So if they can find a way by which people can become motivated to do a good job, which in, in, in healthcare should involve caring for people, in a, being motivated about caring, then I, I wouldn't be against it. But the lessons from Britain is in the opposite direction. So if you're in the care system in Britain, the care system for the elderly and the infirm has been almost entirely privatised. And in those care homes, people are cared for by people on minimum wage, many of whom are migrants who don't speak English or speak minimum English. So you're looked after by people who can't really do a job based on caring. So these jobs in the past, nursing and care workers' jobs, were based on the idea that you would go and do that job because you actually cared for the people where you would do it. Whereas now, people do those jobs because it pays a wage and they barely survive on that wage, but that's what they can get. And, and so it has to be context specific. So I wouldn't, wouldn't say condemn what's happening in Pakistan and it may be a partial solution to what should happen there. But the big question there, and as Amartya Sen asked for India, is why isn't it better and more? You know, why India is three and a half times richer than it was in 1990. Are all people in India three and a half times richer? Of course they're not. So why has the collection of taxes not been enough on, on rich people and corporations to enable there to be a much better healthcare system? Our colleague over there said it has got better, but Sen obviously thought it could be much, much better. So it, it's about those uh, th those issues as well. Okay. And uh, at the back. Yeah. Thanks, Terry. Um, it might be a, quite a big question to try and consider with only a few minutes left, but um, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the kind of uh, future gazing basis, I suppose, uh, in, in the context of climate change and as the climate crisis. Um, presents more and more of a stranglehold on everything that's going on in the world, um, how you see the free market narrative panning out uh, as a result of that. Okay, that is a big question. I think it's very mixed. Um, so some parts of the, the market approach have benefited through the, the uh, very significant expansion of, of renewable energy. Um, wind farms like the one off the coast here, solar in some countries, um, have taken off enormously, and that, that's driven by capitalism. I don't have a, a, a problem with that in the sense that it is providing part of the, the solution to emissions. Um, in other respects, uh, it, is hem it is hemmed in by politics, so the Tory government refuses to allow onshore wind because it might spoil the view. Um, I, I, oblivious to the fact that there won't be a view if there's nobody to look at it. Um, so uh, so it, it's very mixed. On the other side of climate change, which is adaptation, there is no market solution to that at all. There is no private market interested organisation that can make profit out of adaptation, or very little. There, there is the possibility Syngenta and Monsanto could make money out of selling different kinds of seeds, which are heat tolerant. Okay, so they're, they're, and they're working on that. So there are, there are little gaps in it, but the vast majority of what is needed for adaptation is not solvable by market forces. And that's going to require, if money is the solution, and that's a big debate, if money is the solution, then um, that money is, has to be based on the polluter pays, which means huge transfers from those who caused climate change to those who are suffering climate change. That's a very short answer. Hi, Terry. Thanks so much for that. Um, unfortunately, I missed the first half an hour, but maybe we can catch up another time. Um, so I had two questions, a very broad one, which maybe I'll save for another time, but um, a more specific question about um, the notion and argument about technology and things like AI displacing workers. Um, 
I hear that argument a lot, and I also hear a counter-argument a lot, which is that in the past there have been numerous examples of technological disruption in labor markets, and um, you know the um, <clears throat> we, we rebound in some way. You know, other industries pop up. There's other um, <clears throat> opportunities for supporting uh, the kinds of technologies that emerge, etc. And uh, I don't, I don't necessarily buy into those arguments, but I just wonder what you, how you would respond to, to that argument, which I think is quite pervasive. Okay. Um, well, to the extent that if we, if we look at the economy as it operates, to the extent that it creates jobs, it would be pretty difficult for me to say I don't want there to be more jobs. But I think, like Winnie said in the video, they should be good jobs, well-paid, respectable of, uh, respectful of the, the workers who are doing them. So I don't, I don't have a problem. I mean, it's pointless to, to argue that there is a problem of poverty and unemployment and then to oppose the creation of new jobs. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it, that, that's, that's not the argument. The argument is about the software that manages how that happens. Now, some people argue that mechanization and, and uh, the formation of, of um, robotized, um, you know, mechanized worker replacement just enables other jobs to be created in other sectors or in other places. I'd like to see that work out and to be proven, uh, and that, that would be fine. My point is that those who promote economic growth and neoliberalism always argue that you need growth in order to supply the, the wealth which can be shared in order to provide welfare. Well, I, I think what we've demonstrated is that they do not want to share it. They want to restrict the amount of welfare that is shared. And also that they don't really give a damn about creating jobs. They're only driven to create jobs if it makes more profit. Their job understandably, is not to create jobs, to give people jobs. So I think we have to be cynical or realistic about the fact that those claims, which are about how capitalism, through GDP and economic growth, solves the problem of poverty, we should analyse that very carefully and say, is that really what is going on? Is that their goal? And it's not their goal. If, if what their goal does serves humanity, then all well and good. But my argument is that, that that served humanity in the 50s and 60s in Europe, but it does not serve them now. So it's about these different rules and then manipulating the rules to get what they want against what we need. Well, I'm delighted to um, have so many of you come and to get your questions. If you want to talk other times, I'm very happy to meet up um, for um, discussions. And if you want the slides, do just send me an email and I will share them with you. Thank you very much for coming. I just wonder how many times uh, VMAs get... No, they don't. I know they don't. Because last year I did this.